So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our moderator for allowing us to switch our, the order of our talks. The logical sequence between these two will make more sense as you witness the talks. Um, my name is uh, Steve Herbener. I'm a graduate student at the Colorado State University, and uh, Dr. William Cotton is my advisor. And uh, I wanted to talk today about some work that we've been doing in the uh, feasibility study, the mitigation of the intensity of tropical cyclones by seeding, uh, CCN seeding in the outer rain band region. So today's talk, I'll do an introduction and then go through the simulation, set up an experiment design, and then show some results and then give you a summary. So in the 60s, uh, there was a growing interest in the mitigation of the intensity of tropical cyclones, and this culminated in Project Storm Fury. And the basic idea behind Storm Fury was to see the region just outside the eye wall with ice nuclei, and in order to drive an eye wall replacement cycle, and then you would get a bigger uh, eye with a slower, the associated slower wind speeds through the uh, conservation of angular momentum. And Storm Fury ultimately failed due to the lack of enough supercooled liquid water in the seeding region to get this eye wall replacement um, process to occur. And then more recently, in 2005, we had a pretty ugly hurricane season, and that kind of sparked some new interest in um, uh, investigating methods of mitigating storm intensity. So some new strategies have come up, and some examples are works that uh, Cotton and Rosenfeld have done. And these are based on seeding in the, uh, with CCN in the uh, outer rain band region. The idea behind these is in the outer rain bands, if you increase uh, CCN at lower levels, this will reduce the collision coalescence process, which makes more uh, cloud droplets available uh, in that region, and then if those happen to intersect with updrafts in the convection, then those will get lifted up to where they can become supercooled and freeze, and this freezing will release latent heat due to freezing, and that will enhance the, the updrafts in that region, enhance the convection, and get the cold rain process uh, growing in that region, and then the ensuing precipitation from that process will, will uh, through evaporative processes, will increase the uh, cold pool strength in that region. That cold pool strength will uh, block the flow of energy into the storm core and reduce its intensity. So if, if successful, this approach would overcome the, the primary uh, downfall of storm fury by providing the supercooled liquid water content that's needed to get it to work right. And this study is looking at the effects of uh, broadcast seeding, which is just large-scale seeding around the periphery of the storm, and, uh, and it goes through a simulation process of a developing tropical cyclone. And we're more or less kind of looking for patterns in this um, in the storm response that could lead to tactics that would use a more precise and a smaller scale and a more feasible kind of approach to the seeding procedures. So we use the RAM system at um, CSU to, to do these simulations. We're using a triple two-way uh, interactive nested grid. And one thing to note is that the grid resolution and the fine grid is 1.5 kilometers. And we initialize it with an axisymmetric vortex and a little warm bubble to kind of kick the convection going. And we also use an F-plane centered on 15 north, 40 west, and the idea behind the F, using an F-plane is so that the storm would kind of remain um, inside the grid and not move outside the grid, and that just kind of simplified the simulation. And we're using new um, sea salt aerosol source code and aerosol scavenging code that was developed by uh, uh, Gustavo Cario and, and, uh, and adding that in as well. So the experiment was put together by, um, we, had, we were using seven CCN concentration amounts ranging from 100 to 8,000 per cc. And we're using one initial simulation to spin up the tropical cyclone before we introduce the seeding. And I ran this from zero to 60 hours, but I saved the state at 36 hours and at 48 hours and 60 hours so I could use those as uh, starting points in the seeding process. 
And during this initial simulation, the CCN concentration is set to kind of a clean background value of 100 per cc. And uh, then I ran three sets with uh, each of the seven um, CCN levels, and I ran, ran from 36 hours to 72 hours, 48 and 60 to 72 hours. And um, the seeding is being applied to the periphery of the storm in the entire southwest quadrant of the storm. So this is a really large amount of seeding that's happening. Uh, these plots show the results of the uh, experiment where we initiated the seeding at 36 hours in their time series. And on the left is an intensity metric that's based on the surface wind speed. And on the right is a metric, it's just the total kinetic energy of the, soar, uh, of the storm in a slab taken in the lower thousand meters of the storm. So that, that one relates a little bit more toward, to the size of the storm. And both of these are kind of factors in the destructive power of the storm. And as you can see, um, there's a fairly good spread of responses in the, um, in both the intensity and the kinetic energy in the 100 per cc trace up here and some of the concentration levels that are near, you can see kind of a non-monotonic response going on. However, with the higher concentration levels like the 5,000 and the 8,000, you can see a definite reduction in the intensity. So from this point on in the talk, I wanted to talk about the differences between the 100 and the 8,000 per cc um, um, concentration levels since they have such a marked difference between them. And the, the green is the 100 per cc and the red is the 8,000 per cc. Um, these two plots are the same quantities, but the top ones are for the initiation of the seeding starting at 48 hours, and the bottom one is for the initiation of the seeding starting at 60 hours. And you can see that the, uh, the impact of the seeding kind of diminishes as you start the seeding process later and later in time. And I would suspect that this is just the dynamics of the storm. It's spinning up through this period, and it's almost a mature storm by 60 hours in the simulation. The dynamics of the storm are just kind of overpowering the efforts of getting the seeding to go into the storm and have an impact. Um, back to the... Uh, uh, the initiation of the seeding at 36 hours, these are some microphysical and dynamical properties that are going on, and, the, and this is the difference between uh, the 100 per cc and the 8,000 per cc levels. And the black trace is the 100, and the uh, green trace is the 8,000. So first of all, in the upper left, you can see a, um, uh, this is the total supercool cloud droplet mass, and you can see that the 100 per cc kind of reaches a steady state and stays fairly level at that point, but the 8,000 uh, per cc experiment uh, hits a point where the droplet mass suddenly ramps up, and this, I believe, is from the warm rain process being shut down, and then more available uh, cloud droplets getting, and they're going to get lofted up. And um, in the, um, this is the average vertical velocity in the um, updraft regions. Oh, and 1.2, the, all these plots are taken from the rain band region from, 80, from a radius of 80 kilometers out to 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers. So this is just the outer rain band um, quantities here. And you can see kind of a similar thing. Um, what's going on here is the cloud droplet mass increases, and then a little while later these, there's an average increase in the um, updraft speed. And then this is followed by this plot here has the precipitation rate, and that's followed by an increase in the precipitation rate. And one thing to note, too, is this precipitation rate uh, plot is, is the rate, not the amount. So I think what's happening here is you're seeing the warm rain process being shut down and the rate goes down, but then the cold rain process takes off and increases again. And here's some more quantities from the initiation at 36 hours experiment. And the top is theta E, and this is azimuthal averaged quantity, so that's it's um, radius versus the height in the storm. And you can see in the outer rain band regions, there's quite a marked cooling going on from this, uh, from this plot here. And you can also kind of see the cooling kind of encroaching onto the storm center 
here it's quite a bit warmer, and here you've got some cooling. And the bottom plot is the um, um, tangential speed. So this shows kind of the storm structure, and you can kind of see uh, the associated effect. You've, you've got a pretty strong diminishing of all the strong um, wind speeds at near the eye wall. And you also see kind of a difference in the structure where, the, where this part here is kind of disappearing and you're getting a kind of a reduction of the storm size as well. So in summary, um, the data in this study are consistent with the microphysical dynamical aspects explained in the proposed method. Uh, the degree of the large scale, both uh, spatially, remember we were seeding in the entire southwest quadrant of the storm, and the high concentration of CCN, the, the 8,000 per cc, required to get the definite storm response, make the feasibility of using this method to mitigate storm intensity substantially low, I would think. However, the studies provide insight into the workings of the cold pools in the outer rain band regions of a tropical cyclone and their impacts on both storm intensity and size. And in a companion study um, that Cario and Cotton did, and which will be um, part of discussion of the next paper presented here, it's shown that via the same microphysical dynamical process that a significant storm response can be seen with a very precise targeted seeding effort. So that's everything I've got, and thank you for your attention. When you say you got 8,000, is that 8,000 CCN or 8,000 droplets or what? It's, it's 8,000 uh, particles per cc. So it's, it's it, yes, so it's all CCN. There's, there's no giant CCN levels being uh, uh, modulated here in this experiment. Would that be like a 1% or? Um, so the total population of aerosol that can be activated. That can be activated. Assuming the yes. ammonium sulfate and the human side. But would it be activated? I mean, when you got that high of number, you don't, you, the supersaturation is suppressed. Yeah. The model is predicting supersaturation and does act. What, what is the supersaturation? I can't tell you. I mean, is it like I, it's around 1%. I think it was 1%. Yeah, it's just high updrafts. Oh, yeah. What uh, condensation coefficient? <coughs> That's not yet totally true. We're using mm -hmm. ammonium sulfate and, oh, you mean the condensation? Condensation coefficient. Um, I forgot that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not recalling. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next question. Well, if no more. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I think I asked the question before. What is the sensitivity of this model to the ice nucleation for meteorization? What, which kind of meteorization you are using? Because the ice formation will change the position. And the, you change the cool, the cold pool, and you change the, the, the timing and so forth. So I think it's, it's rather important to know what kind of parameterization you use it for that. So this is using a bulk scheme, and and there are um, seven to eight categories in there, and and so ice has uh, pristine ice, and it has aggregates, and it has grapple and hail. So I guess four categories in that. So they all the, the scheme uh, has all of those interacting, so I'm not I'm not intentionally seeding with ice nuclei in this, but uh, but the microphysics scheme is handling the conversion between the different types. So this is the modified version of my scheme. Uh, all right, uh, it's a quick one. You're in trouble. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I only want to comment that uh, I think it's Black and Hallett. I'm not quite sure, but they did a lot of uh, measurements around hurricanes, and they couldn't find any areas where they couldn't f They always found ice in their fights. So um, I, I, I'm just curious whether you're having lots of areas with no ice. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember the... the plots that I made, I, I definitely got a response in the ice particles, you know, and you could see those growing aloft in the uh, 
outer frame band regions, but I didn't choose to put it in this presentation. Um, I, I remember it being kind of um, kind of moderate, weak to moderate, I think, in that sense. But, but you definitely saw the response there. So I think uh, also I wanted to, I haven't done this part yet, but I wanted to go look at the aggregates because I'm kind of expecting the, the aggregates to show a stronger reaction to this, and that's more of the, the cold 